All right, beloved. I guess I'm live now. All right. Greetings to you, one and all. All you who call upon the name of the Lord. All you beloved of God and redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ and sanctified by the Holy Ghost. All right. Uh, it's uh, sort of uh, New Year's Eve, but uh, who cares? There's so many questions and requests to uh, to talk about things, to explain things, and so on. So uh, today, I want to talk about the Lord's repenting, or you know, the cases where the Bible talks about the Lord repenting of certain things. And uh, so the question is, can the one repent who by definition is not the son of man that he should repent okay so how can it be said of the lord who is immutable unchangeable who nevertheless is recorded as repenting of certain things or judging certain actions of man that it uh repented the lord you know, certain things. So we want to talk about that. And in connection with this uh, question of whether or not the God who is immutable, with whom there is no shadow of turning and so on, who can repent what it, what it means, and also the more difficult and profound question of whether or not the God can have passions or emotions which overtake him in the matter of man so that when we're you know consumed with grief or whatever any feeling that we do things that uh, contradict our uh, other purposes or rational judgment and so on we're going to talk about that and even more underlying question which we just we're going to hopefully just touch is the question of interpretation because i will show you guys that uh, we have at least uh, this is a glaring example one chapter in the bible where you have Three statements about the Lord's repenting and not repenting. And so you have to wrestle with scriptures in order to come to the right uh, conclusions. So it, uh, when people say, well, you just read the Bible as it is and you don't interpret it, uh, you know, it doesn't cut it. You have to roll up your sleeves. You have to think hard. Uh, you have to do your homework in order to uh arrive to a right uh, understanding of uh, god's word all right without further ado all right the question was of the lord's repentance well the first uh example would be in the book of genesis and you all know this famous passage in the in the uh sixth chapter of the book of genesis when the men uh, begin to multiply in the earth and, and so on and subdue it and uh they be uh, the the flash all flesh has gone out of the way and it began sinning big time. And it says that um, in Genesis chapter 6, starting from verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man of the earth on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy a man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air for, and he repeats the same thing, it repenteth me, or I repent, that I have made them. Okay, so you have a case of the Lord's repenting of the first creation. So people naturally, you know, pose this question, well, if uh, the Lord is so immutable, if his... Uh, intentions of his heart uh, continue forever and he's sort of he has a fixed determination to glorify himself as you Calvinists insist and, and sovereign grace people how come that here we have an example of the Lord actually repenting and what what is uh, what can it mean that he repented that he created man on the face of the earth and that's a very very good question now <clears throat> The difficulty is that the word itself does not, I mean, the, uh, uh, the term naha, nahal, I mean, uh, naham in the Hebrew, if I'm pronouncing, if I'm getting it right, I mean, I don't know. But 
the word itself has multiple meanings. It's a multifaceted word that it can mean uh, repent, grieve, a sort of regret, especially of past actions. Also to be comforted and even comforted in avenging somebody. There's three or four major uh, senses in which that uh, Hebrew word can be used in, in the Bible, and it's it's used in a variety of ways. So uh, it just the word itself doesn't help a whole lot because it can mean uh, repentance in the way we understand uh, repentance. But it's basically grieving, and some translations correctly render that uh, it grieved the Lord in his uh, in in his heart. So he was grieved or sorry, but uh, it is not. That appeared from the text itself. You say, well, it's just, uh, it's an interpretation. Well, let's go. Uh, uh, here's an interesting thing about the origins of the word. The primitive root of that word, properly to sigh, that is, breathe strongly. So this is a sort of a sigh of regret. When you give out the sigh of something that you regret deeply. So that's the primitive uh idea of that word okay now let's go to numbers 23 uh, and we'll, we'll look at verse uh, 19 especially uh, because that verse seems to go against Genesis 6 6 and it brings the problem of well how do we reconcile how do we interpret scripture do we just neglect one part and emphasize the other so how do we so uh, this is a famous verse and uh, most uh, Calvinists or Sovereign Grace people love it because it uh, uh, set forth uh, the um, immutability of God's purpose, okay, unchangeableness. All right, um, remember the story uh, very quickly that Balaam is the, the, the prophet, that he gets certain revelations, uh, whether he was a saved man, probably not, and so forth. But Balaam, king of Moabites, he calls this prophet because he was the seer and he was getting visions from the Lord and said, well, you got to curse the people of Israel because there are too numerous for me to handle. So he says, well, I'll give you gifts. And you know the story about ba uh, Balaam's uh, donkey and uh, how he was deterred uh, uh, in his coming to Balak. So finally he arrives on the scene. But the word of the Lord comes to Balaam as Balak, that king, is trying to influence Balaam into cursing the people of Israel. And so, uh, <clears throat> so Balaam says to him, and he took up his parable. This is uh, verse 18 in, in, uh, in the book of uh, Numbers, 20, uh, chapter 23. And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man, listen to this, that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Here we go. Hath he said, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And the question is, of course, rhetorical. Of course he will do it. And see, very emphatically it says that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither, uh, neither the son of man that he should repent. And it's, it's, it's the same word here uh, uh, that is, was used in uh, Genesis 6, 6 and verse 7, that he repented the Lord and so on. Now, you say, well... This uh, verse seems to be kind of clear that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. So that there's certain, triggers your attention, that there are certain aspects, whatever it may have meant by the inspired author, Moses in the case of uh, Genesis, to pan down that he repented the Lord and so forth. Whatever it meant, it could not have meant that a change uh, in God, so that he would change his course, okay, so he, he's not a man, hath he said he shall not do it, and it's in the context that he began to bless the people, and he will certainly bless Israel, and he beholds no iniquity, and further in, in that chapter, I, I don't have uh, time right now to look at it carefully, there are so many theological truths in it, but uh, it was given to Balaam to correctly prophesy not only of the future of Israel as it is contemplated uh, from the standpoint of eternity, but not just eternity, but eternity in Christ. 
that the whole seed of Israel, uh, not, not ethnic, not all of the fleshly posterity of Israel, for remember, not, not all Israel that is of Israel, but only uh, children of the promise that are counted for the seed, according to Romans 9. So that's that Israel in whom God beholds no iniquity as the chosen people of all nations in Christ Jesus for forever perfected in Christ and by Christ because of his work. And so he's given this vision that he beholds them. So in that context, he says, look, if God began to bless, who am I to stop him? I'm going to repeat what God says that if, if he blesses Israel and if God blesses anybody, surely they will be blessed. That's the meaning of Balaam in, in that passage. So, all right, this is a very strong evidence uh, against the idea that God may somehow repent in the sense, boy, I did something wrong. I got to change the course of actions and so forth. No, no, no. God is not a man that he should lie or uh, neither the son of man that he should repent. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is a classical chapter where you have uh, three statements which have, I mean, three, uh, three verses which contain the word, which has been translated as repent, uh, that uh, Hebrew word, Naham. And, uh, and there's a, an interesting twist because there's, there's an apparent contradiction in the chapter. Let's go to uh, uh, 1 Samuel 15. Now, you know the story. That Saul is just recently anointed and, and uh, appointed as the king, the first king of Israel, by, by the Lord through uh, the seer Samuel. So, and uh, in the course of action, he's given this command, direct command by the Lord, to destroy and utterly obliterate Amalekites. Remember, and it's a fulfillment of the prophecy given in Exodus that the name of Amalek shall be blotted out from under heaven. So Saul is given this command. All right, you got to deal with them. You got to destroy everybody, old and young, every everybody who has breath of life, in it. and every and and livestock and, and you know animals, everything. You got to destroy and devote wholly to destruction. That was the instructions of the Lord. But Saul was whether it was influence of the of the people and so forth. Uh, he did not obey completely. Because he spared Agag, the, their king, and also much cattle. And so Samuel, when he appears on the scene, and the word of the Lord came unto Samuel while he was still tarrying. And it says in verse 10, <clears throat> Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me. Now this is the Lord's uh, speaking himself. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now, this is significant. If this is the Lord himself, he said, Well, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me. Then Samuel uh, goes to that place where there's supposed to be this communal sacrifice and uh, and, and Saul changes heart, and he uh, he behaved wickedly. Then he's trying to lie. Look, it is the people they, they talk to. Uh, so there's this conversation that takes place between Samuel and Saul. And this is what this is what Samuel says to Saul in the process. He said, "Look, you should have been you know beaten because you, you you're the first king." And uh, and Samuel said unto him, "The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee." from thee this day and have given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou this is verse 28 of uh, chapter 15 of first Samuel and he says and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent for he is not a man that he should repent you know crystal clear again black and white this is well that he's, uh, the Lord is not a man. So he's, he's prophesying of David and ultimate love Christ because Christ is the, remember my previous video that the, this, my David, uh, my servant David shall be their prince forever. So ultimately it's fulfilled in Christ. But even David, so he's uh, that, that shepherd 
he says that it shall be taken from thee and given to a neighbor of thine. That is better than thou. Why? Because he's a man of God's own heart, but of God's own choosing. And so he says, and also the strength of Israel, referring to God, God is the strength of Israel, will not lie nor repent. So it's sort of, it's a reminiscent of this promise. The Lord has sworn and not repent. Thou art the king, uh, uh, thou art the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110. So he's not a man that he should repent. So he's not going to change his mind. So whatever... It may have meant in Genesis 6, 6, 6 it, it cannot mean the change of one's mind so as to change his course of action. As, oh boy, I made a mistake. I got to do something. I got to patch it up. I have to sort of amend. First, there's something that I haven't thought of previously. No, no, no. Not in reference to the omniscient God of heaven and earth. Okay? So this is very clear. But... You go down, I mean, you read the whole, uh, the whole thing in the, in the chapter, uh, and it ends, verse 35. Look at this, verse 35 of that same chapter. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until, until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a classical example of why uh, we should um, really think hard about the question of proper interpretation. It's not a question of whether or not we should apply some rules of interpretation in doing it or because some people say, well, you just read the Bible as it is, just, you know, evangelicals, fundamentalists, say, well, we just, we just believe the Bible. We don't believe Calvary. We, we just believe the Bible. Whatever it says, well, you've got to, Interpret it because here uh, in the in the in the one chapter you have seemingly contradicting statements because twice it says that it repented the Lord that he said uh, Saul uh, king over Israel and in in the same chapter self same chapter it also says that uh, strength of Israel will not lie nor repent for he is not a man that he should repent so. <laughs> He won't repent, he can't repent, and there, but nevertheless, he did repent. So what does it mean? So the question of uh, proper hermeneutics. Uh, the Westminster Confession of uh, Faith is kind of helpful on this point. It says that all things in Scripture are not a plain alike, but some texts are more perspicuous, more clear than the others. So the interpretation, the proper sense of some obscure verse is... To be explained in the light of a more explicit or detailed verse which kind of sheds light upon scriptures which are not not as clear so statements like that the god where with where uh, it says you know explicitly that god will not lie nor repent for he is not a man that he should repent should govern the verses and explain those verses which which says that re repented the lord and uh, and what it actually means, as uh, many uh, Bible translations reflect that that uh, usage, is that it grieved the Lord. And here we come to a next uh, question, well, adjacent question of whether or not the Almighty has passions or emotions. You know, somebody posed that question. Well, I can't locate the exact, uh, but the the question concerned that. Does God have emotions, so forth? And here we have the doctrine, the old doctrine. Theologians speak about impassibility of God, that God has no passions, i.e., that God is free from emotions which overtake his nature or make him subject to his own. So he's sort of, God is not a subject of flying handles saying, well, boy, I'm so out of my mind. I'm so mad. You know, we, we use expressions like, Boy, I got so mad, I said something, I did something that I regretted. No, that cannot occur with the, uh, you know, perfect God who is all perfect by definition. He cannot contradict himself. He is not given to, to sinful passions that would obscure his judgment and so forth. All right, you'll say, well... 
Well, what about so many, you know, verses and texts which says that, uh, well, the wrath of God was burned against Moses. Remember when uh, Moses was trying to kind of uh, uh, pass the buck, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't want to become God's messenger into Egypt. And so, well, I can't talk, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a very... Uh, a very good uh, talker and so forth, and the, and the Lord, uh, Lord's anger was bur burned against uh, uh, Moses, or he was wroth against the people of Israel on numerous occasions. He was also rejoicing. He loves the righteous. He will rejoice over Israel. So you have so many references to God's actually having emotions. So what does it mean that God is has no passions? Well. It must mean, according to uh, the totality of scriptural revelation, is that we are made in God's image. And there's such a thing as anthropomorphic language or expressions of God. What it means is that we're created in the image of God. But God is not like unto us. We are like unto Him in certain respects. But because of sin, noetic influences of sin, because of our dark and understanding and so forth, we struggle to understand. That's why even scripture itself is written in a language that sometimes is hard to understand. Or people rest those scriptures to their own destructions. For instance, when the Bible says that the finger of God, or we are the work of His hands. Well, it doesn't mean, it cannot mean that the Lord who is spirit has little hands, little fingers, and that he actually, or the eyes of the Lord, or ears of the Lord, uh, he does not have physical ears. I mean, in reference to God proper, of course, the Son, who assumed our flesh, he does have ears and, and, and uh, all of the human capacities and faculties, but uh, God, properly speaking, the throne, eternal everlasting, God does not have those, those things. So it's, it's just a language which is fitted uh, to our understanding so that we can glean certain things about God. So, for instance, the expression, the work of His hands, means that He created us. So that the regeneration is a very intimate, intricate work of God Himself. So it's not just speaking the word that He actually created us, recreated us in Christ Jesus. It just, it goes to show the extent of work which has to be done to make us into a new creation, like into the first creation that God, the Lord God formed, man, remember, from the dust of the earth and, and, and so on, and breathed his spirit into his nostrils, and the man became the living being, or the living soul, in the, if you read a little in. So uh, <clears throat> those expressions, they just uh, communicate certain things about God, but they're not to be taken literally. So going back to the question, how can it be said of God that he repented? Well, it means that, again, he grieved. He grieved his soul. Well, does it mean that he said, well, that in the, again, in the fashion of man, oh gosh, I'm, boy, I'm so sorry that I created you guys. You're so wicked. I'm going to wipe you off from the face of the earth. And so does it mean in this way that uh, he sort of changed his mind? No, there's no metanoia in that, uh, in that sense in God. Because he knows, known unto God are all of his works from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning. He knows all things. He not only knows them, he purposed them. All of his works are consistent with the intentions of his heart, which stand throughout all generations. They never change. He knows what he's doing. So what he means, or what, what Moses means when he says that it, uh, God repented, it means that he grieved his heart. It means that, look, if we human beings have emotions, it means that if we can rejoice over good things, and if we, get, if we grieve or experience a righteous, you know, truly righteous indignation when beholding things of 
that contradict the holy nature of God, when people trample out of their feet, uh, or, uh, you know, God's holy law or ordinances and so forth, it reflects that God is also grieved by those things. He's not moved in the sense as to change his direction, but it means he has not taken pleasure in the wickedness. The, the all flesh has gone out of the way. It grieved his heart. He knew what he was doing from the beginning, which is the very fact. It also reminiscent of, of uh, for instance, in, in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark, we see this very human, I shouldn't say even human, it's just, it's the pure response and reaction of a pure person of Jesus Christ, God incarnate, very God, but also very man. Remember in the synagogue that, that God, that man with a shriveled hand, and so and uh, and he said, "Well, should I do good or evil on the Sabbath?" And, uh, and everybody was silent because they were trying to trap him. And he looked around in this anger, and also it grieved his heart that people are so hard-hearted. So, if God in the flesh experiences those emotions, they're not sinful. It means that that God also has those emotions. He cannot be less than ourselves. So if we have joy or something, it means that God has joy. He rejoices and he means that. But his emotions, unlike ours, are in perfect harmony with his holy character, with his judgment. They never in contradict, never in conflict with his rational judgment. So with us, it's a different story. Sometimes I mean... I know what needs to be done, suffered, but I may get tired or tickled by somebody's behavior and say, look, I just got to do something else. Or I say things rational, then I regret, I repent. Truly, I must repent. Not so with God. It says that God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 5. He is angry. Boy, I mean, take uh, the fires of hell. And that, remember, it says in the book of Hebrews and elsewhere that our oh, God is a consuming fire. Now, hell is the expression of God's anger, and that anger is eternal. But lo and behold, you do have a very strong emotion. So it's not just when people say, well, God is without passion. It doesn't mean that God is somehow, you know, a Martian. Or some, you know, it's like we, you know, picture uh, aliens. That are, they're so rational that they have no emotion. No. We're created in his image. And we have this faculties as a reflection of who God is. God is not less than us. He's greater than us. He's more pure than us, but he's not less. It doesn't mean that he, he's just, you know, sort of a machine who just calculates and purposes things and experiences no emotions. He does experience what I'm trying to say. He does experience all these emotions. But they do not stand in the way of his judgment, of his justice, of his purposes, of his character. They are harmonious uh, to his other perfections and attributes. That, that's all I'm trying to say. Okay. So hopefully this uh, was somewhat helpful for some of you that uh, repented the Lord and uh, that he cannot, should not repent. Those two things we, we have in the Bible, and uh, it takes some, you know, home, homework to, uh, to arrive to a proper understanding, but the Holy Spirit guides us, guides us and gives us proper understanding and the proper interpretation of Scripture, always interprets Scripture. It not only interprets, it informs Scripture. It's not just taking dictionary and lexicon. No, you got to study the Bible and see what it says, and reason, and compare spiritual with spiritual. Then you understand, ha, ah, this is what it means, that it repented the Lord, that he said Saul, uh, uh, that he made Saul king over Israel. All right, well, that'll be it for now. Uh, may the Lord bless us all uh, to know God more, to love him more, to love the brethren, to do good, and uh, to continue our fellowship. Fellowship of Grace. May God bless you all and Happy New Year.